In qualche punto del nostro cammino succede che si perde cognizione delle cose importanti della vita, come quei momenti unici che condividiamo con famiglia e amici, il piacere di sedersi a tavola e gustare pasti gustosi e salutari, tenendo cura del proprio benessere. E gli anni d'oro riscopriamo l'importanza di queste cose ed è il momento di godersele. Dolce Vita Retirement Living, 854 Erie Street, Windsor. Heavenly Rest Cemetery, il complesso di imponenti mausolei con varietà di scelta dove le persone care sono custodite religiosamente fino alla risurrezione. Heavenly Rest Cemetery, fiero patrocinatore di panorama italiano. Gennaro Caffè, che bontà! Gentili telespettatori, benvenuti a Panorama Italiano. Nel programma di oggi vi riportiamo la seconda parte dell'intervista che abbiamo fatto con Elio Del Coll. In questa diciamo, intervista riportiamo un po' della intervista fatta la, riportata appunto la settimana scorsa e poi vi riporteremo qualche cosa di nuovo, diciamo dei quadri e di tante altre cose che questo artista eh, fenomenale eh, ha diciamo, pitturato oppure ha scolpito oppure ha disegnato. Quindi sarà una, 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 diciamo, una intervista abbastanza interessante, quindi seguiteci. Oggi non abbiamo una intervista con uh, Max Porelli, ma mi ha chiamato per informarvi che ancora c'è di prendere diciamo, qualità di uva disponibile per coloro che vogliono fare ancora un buon bicchiere di vino. Ci sono differenti qualità disponibili, bianca e nera, e quindi qualora siete interessati potete recarvi da Borelli ad Howard, da Max Borelli, e diciamo, prendere l'opportunità appunto di fare un buon bicchiere di vino. Max ci comunica anche che i prezzi sono un po' più flessibili e ci saranno almeno altre due o tre settimane di disponibilità di uva. Quindi, coloro interessati, regatevi da Max e fate un buon bicchiere di vino, sia bianco che rosso. Volevo poi informarvi, gentili degli spettatori, che come negli altri anni il Levin Rest Cemetery ha organizzato anche quest'anno il Cemetery Sunday, una domenica di preghiere per i nostri defunti e quest'anno è domenica il 4 di novembre alle ore 3 al mausoleo di San Francesco, quindi come diciamo gli altri anni. Quest'anno ci sarà il Sua Eccellenza il Vescovo Joseph D'Ambroschi eh, nella celebrazione di questo, diciamo, di questo evento ed è qualcosa veramente di caratteristico, di commovente, c'è la partecipazione di tanta tanta gente appunto per recarsi in, nel cimitero e ricordare i defunti, i cari defunti che non sono più con noi. Quindi eh, prendete l'opportunità di passare questa ora insieme con tante altre persone e ricordare i nostri cari defunti. Ovviamente ci sono sedie disponibili per tutti per eh, passare questa ora eh, comodamente e diciamo, eh, pregare per i nostri defunti e vedere tante tante altre persone che si recano appunto a questa cerimonia e questa poi un'altra occasione per incontrarci e rivederci con tanti amici che diciamo 
condividiamo questa situazione di avere i nostri cari defunti nello stesso prezzo o in qualche altro posto, ma ci richiamo a questa funzione appunto per pregare per i nostri defunti. Quindi ricordate, gentili telespettatori, il 4 di novembre alle 3 al Levniress Cemetery al Mosoleo di San Francesco per le preghiere per i defunti con la partecipazione di Sua Eccellenza i Vescovo D'Ambroschi. Inoltre volevo informarvi, gentili telespettatori, che la Canadian Italian Business and Professional Association ha organizzato un, uh, un evento molto molto speciale per raccogliere fondi per uh, il Cancer, la Cancer Foundation e per uh, i diciamo le borse di studio per gli studenti è un evento molto molto particolare con eh, un menu stravagante e con tanto diciamo con tanto di intrattenimento l'evento comincerà alle 6 per l'antipasto e quindi il, la, la cena sarà poi servita alle 7 e mezza uh, questa festa si chiama Surf Torfia, è una cosa diciamo molto molto particolare in quanto ci nel menu ci sono molte qualità di pesci e ed è un menu veramente veramente particolare, con, eh, come ho detto con l'intrattenimento da parte della, eh, del complesso fantasia e questo evento è al Caboto Club il 10 di novembre prossimo, quindi ricordate eh, questo surf turfia al Caboto Club il 10 di novembre prossimo per raccogliere i soldi per la Cancer Foundation e per le borse di studio eh, per gli italiani all'Università di Windsor per i ragazzi che pigliano l'italiano. Per informazioni potete chiamare Joe Balsamo al 250-5190, interno 406 e oppure il Capoto Club al 252-8383. Eh, partecipate, è qualcosa veramente di caratteristico e la Canadian Italian Businessman Association invita tutti a partecipare a questo evento e quindi a dare all'associazione all l'opportunità di raccogliere soldi sia per la Cancer Foundation come pure per eh, le borse di studio per i ragazzi che vogliono prendere l'italiano all'Università di Vincero. Ripeto, i numeri da chiamare eh, Gio Balsamo 250-5190, interno 416, oppure Giovanni Capoto Club al 252-8383. Ed ora, gentili telespettatori, passiamo al nostro programma. Arrivederci a tra poco. Gentili telespettatori, oggi siamo nello studio di Elio Del Col. Elio è un friulano, Elio? Sì. From Friuli? Yes. Yeah. Capisce l'italiano, ma non lo parla tanto <ride> bene. Allora, per esprimersi in una maniera, diciamo, corretta, eh, parliamo in inglese questa volta, ma la cultura, le, diciamo l'arte, eh, well, l'arte non ha nazionalità, ma comunque questa è tutta arte italiana eh, che ha pigliato appunto gli spunti dall'Italia ed Elio è, ha fatto tutta la vita nell'arte, nell qualche cosa veramente di incredibile, da sculture, pitture, incisore, eh, vedremo eh, in questa intervista le varie qualità, le varie qualità artistiche che Elio del Coll ha. Elio, come va stamattina? Eh, bene! Bravo, ho visto che c'hai una bellissima veduta di dietro con il fiume, questi prati verdi, questa cosa, com'è l'inverno? Oh, uh, it's a beautiful place, yeah. beautiful place. It's, it's, it's for working, it's for living, uh, I love it. You got a lot of inspiration back there, do you? Yes. Yeah, when you are working, at a certain point you need a little bit of break, you go out a little bit, 
you see the view and that gives you more power to do it. And sometimes I see the view and uh, it's so beautiful it distracts me. Yeah, it distracts <laughs> Sometimes yeah. that's where I want to be. So, yeah. But anyway, <laughs> listen, as you, as you, how you became an artist? Let's put it simple yeah. this way. Well, like a lot of young children, I like to draw. And uh, as I got older, I got, I got better. And uh, oh, when I was in school, I thought, maybe this is what I can do for a living. But when I graduated from high school, there wasn't much opportunity to go to school for art. Uh, fine art, maybe at the university, but I wanted to learn how to make a living, do commercial art. Not much around, so I did some apprenticeships. And as a, as a young boy, I worked as an apprentice sign painter, then I worked in some stained glass and uh, photo screening, silk screening. Uh, after that, I started to develop my skills and I worked for a printer where I did the artwork for printing. And then I moved on to another printer where we had a studio set up and I was uh, the director of the studio and did the artwork. And uh, after years of that, um, I moved on. I opened my own studio and did that for oh, a good number of years in Walkerville. And after Walkerville, I moved to Mackenzie Hall. They sent me uh, an inquiry. Would I like to move into the new building, the Mackenzie Hall building? Beautiful building. So I moved and I spent years there. And that's when I developed my printmaking and my fine art. I did that, started it in Walkerville, developed it in, uh, in Mackenzie Hall in Sandwich. And after uh, nine years in Sandwich, I moved here to Amherstburg 20 years ago because they offered me uh, I was offered an opportunity to move into a bigger facility where I had room to do more things. This is where I started to do the sculpture because I had room to do the sculpture. I had room to do many more things than I could do before because before I just had a small studio. And uh, I've been here ever since doing uh, press work, uh, prints, painting. I started painting at McKenzie Hall. I started doing watercolors, oil painting. Came here, developed the sculpture. I started doing some some nice sculptures that I enjoyed doing. I did the. Uh, I was commissioned to do the uh, sculpture at the Fried Orman Center. Uh, big wall sculpture. Uh, later, I did uh, the big sculpture at the uh, Child's Place. Uh, that was a big tree that was built right into the wall. Uh, major commissions like that are fun, but they're not. There are not many like that. So I came here, I started doing my carving, developing into sculptures, and uh, and then from time to time I would leave that and do some painting and go back and do some printmaking and do... So I have a variety of things that I've been doing ever since. Well, you have been naughty in Italy. Yes, I was very fortunate. Uh, uh, in 1995, a friend of mine saw a notice appealing to artists. Would you like a place in Italy in return for artwork. So we gave him a piece of artwork and he gave us this beautiful house in, uh, in Cesole, in the Bormida Valley. And uh, we went there for a month. I came home with 60 graphite sketches of all the little towns and streets. And, and uh, still to this day, every now and then I look at one of those sketches and I use that to do a painting from the sketch. Uh, so that will never leave. That's always coming out. Italy is, is there. I have watercolors, I have prints, I have graphites, all from my trip to Italy. And, and there was a, a kind of experience for you, right? That was wonderful. If I was a little bit younger, they, uh, they offered us a building. They said, why don't you buy this building and uh, come and live here? And if I was a little bit younger, I, I would have thought about that seriously. But I was at a point where my roots were here, and uh, I sometimes think maybe I should have gone. Yeah. But do you love this place over here? Anyway? Oh, this is a, it's a nice town. Amherstburg is a great town. I love it. I've, I've been here 20 years now. Um, for the first 15 years or so, all I did was work. I just, if, if people made the effort to come in, I was happy to have them, but I didn't try to entice people to come in because I was by myself working. And uh, for the last five years or so, we've had the windows open and uh, it's nice to meet a lot of nice people. 
uh, it keeps me in touch with the street. I'm, I'm right on the street where everything happens and I feel like I'm in, in touch. I see that you have a, a book in there and there are quite a few comments on the book and quite a few signatures. So the people, they come over here and they see all of these uh, beautiful painting and sculpture and stuff like that and they enjoy it. They do, they do and, and a lot of people will sign the book and leave their address and email whatever and uh, so when I do a show they would like to be invited but uh, it's probably been 10, 12 years since I did a show. Yeah, I, did yeah. a, I did a couple shows at the Gibson Gallery because uh, they're local, they're a very nice, beautiful little gallery. But uh, to do the studio show, uh, I guess I get just a little too comfortable and uh, I haven't done one. Every year I say I'm going to do a studio are show. You, are you thinking about to do one? Uh very seriously, yes. Very seriously. Yes, because uh, when I do a show, I used to do art shows out of town. I used to travel up north and do art shows, and uh, that means you have to pack everything up in boxes, take it, set it up. It's a, it's a, it's a lot of, a lot of hassle. You have a lot of a piece in there that you can show, and they are beautiful pieces. So I think you should think about the show. I, I can help you out. Okay, I, Try I to that's find a deal. Somebody good, to, good to, uh, people that, that they would love you to have a, one of these in their home. Ah, yeah. that would be nice. That yeah. would be nice, yes. At Unico, every product we carry has a deep tradition behind it. We search far and wide to bring you only quality products. Whether it's an assortment of tomatoes and eggplant or an additional collection of olives and roasted peppers, our goal is to give you the ingredients necessary to cook delicious meals that you can be proud of. Unico, bringing real taste home since 1917. Forest Creative Fireplace, famoso e rinomato negozio per la grande selezione di Napoleon Barbecue. Varietà di stufe a legno, piacevole selezione di caminetti convenzionali su pareti e ricreativi. Forni a legno per deliciosi pizze ed altri piatti. Forest Glade Fireplaces, we are specialists in the art of fire. Forest Glade Fireplace, il negozio di specialisti nell'arte del fuoco. Mancini's Italia Bakery, original family, original recipes, and the tradition continues on. about uh, painting, you talk about sculpture, describing uh, and all the stuff in there. Let's get to one piece of the time. We got the, this nice sculpture over here and this one over here as well. How you get to do th this kind of sculpture? They are so intricate. Uh, 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 how you do that? Uh, I, I, there's no easy answer. I think the best answer is uh, when I was, I was given this, it was a piece of black walnut wood. And uh, I looked at it, looked at it, looked at it, and uh, uh, sometimes just visions come to mind. This piece here, this was a split, it was split all over like this. And I preserved this because I love the natural. Of course. And then I started to do the shapes which I found very tactile. Uh, when people come in, I always tell them, don't, don't stand and look, go feel it. It's, it's, you should put your hands on the yeah, sculpture. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this one, I, it, uh, I probably worked on this for, uh, oh, several years, five, six years yeah. before I finished, before I decided it's finished. I would do so much, I would spend uh, a few days, a week, two weeks in the basement, 
working with it all with the chisel and hammer nothing no power tools and uh, every time I look at it I always see something maybe I could change and then when I ran out of things that I thought I should change, I said, okay, now she's finished. We let her go. Uh, too much of it has to do with the actual boom, boom. But okay. when you're working with the wood, you can smell the wood, you can feel the wood. And that, that, that's you a good excited. feeling. That's a good feeling. Yeah. And then when, like somebody, people always ask, how did you get this so round? Well, yeah. I guess I just didn't give up. Because sometimes I would look at it and I would say, you know what, uh, I don't know if it should be, it should be there. But then when I look at it in the, in totality, I think that is one of the striking parts of the sculpture. What it means, what it symbolizes, you can give your own description. To me, it could be a universal theme, it could be the world, it could be a planet, it could be the sun, it could be fruit, it could be anything. The beautiful thing about a piece of sculpture particularly and even uh, paintings that are abstract or semi-abstract, it brings you in. You can now be a part of it. You interpret it. What's your feeling? What did you get? Then when you're a part of it, it's partly yours. Yes. But if all the answers are there, like in a photograph, then you're still a viewer. I like you to become part of it. And by thinking about this, by having a, a sensation from it, then you're part of it. We have uh, this other piece over here, uh, Elio. This is another work of art. How you come about to do this? This is uh, uh, something very original anyway. Because I don't think there is another one like this in, uh, around. No, no. But it's uh, very interesting because it's um, when it, it gets to be abstract to this point, it's not so much intellect there's a lot of emotion that comes into it because the feel again you have to put your hands on it the feel of it is part of the experience and the design comes from uh, before I in before I got into the fine art I spent uh, who how many years uh, 15 20 years as graphic design and I did a lot of logo design and things that are totally original creative well, I love doing that still, but when I converted everything to the fine art, that sense of graphic design also comes into play. And then when you can meld the two, the graphic design and the fine art, then the emotion and the intellect kind of mix. And uh, that's how these pieces come about. Yeah. And then we've got a one a bigger one in the back over here. This one is... Uh, uh, it's the same it's the same process now when I look at this I see all kinds of things and this is what I expect or hope people will do too right now I can look at this and I can see a figure and I can think of great abstract artists especially from the cubist period that did works that were not literal not realistic not representational but very evocative they, they bring out feelings and uh, there's no way you can exist on this planet if you're interested in art without having influences. And I think this was my influence from the Cubist period. And this one in particular, when I saw the wood and I saw the grain, I thought, I have to do something because it's a nice the, grain. Yes. That's yeah. so that's my really kind of my art. cubist. Yeah. Yes. And then we got this piece over here. This is <laughs> something something fantastic, Elio. This is my uh, piece de resistance. This is my piece that I, I look at and I think I, I, I probably will never do another one like this. It has, it's in the round. There is any way to look at this and get a whole different sense of what it's about. You will, you'll see in an abstract sense, there are figures coming out. There are animal figures, human figures. This up here is it base it has it reminds everybody of a turtle and a turtle actually with its arms on this figure what that represents is it up to interpretation but to me what it was was a mixture of we live on the planet together yeah men women children animals and this came from a piece of uh 
ash. Uh, it was a beautiful, a beautiful piece that had split diagonally, and I took it and started to just work with. Beautiful addition over here. Yeah, and again, it's it has some cubist qualities, but I've never ever really felt drawn to any particular style of work, and to try and uh, imitate. Uh, has no has no value to me, no. but to develop to get into it and see where the wood takes you because this is what happens. This was not designed ahead of time. This was all up here as I was working. One shape would lead me to the ne next shape and the next shape and the next and surfaces as I would evolve. This might have to change because of this later on, but I would let it decide for itself. And obviously, this is only one piece. Uh, yes, of course. Only one piece. Only you one. Have a little bit of time to do it, but uh, it's only one piece. Probably over a year, off and on, to do yeah. this one, and uh, you you end up you live with it day and night, day and night, until you get to a point where I, I could look at that, I could see some things to change, but when I look at it, I'm satisfied with every little surface, and I can't see why it's necessary to change it just so at that point oil it and finish yeah beautiful now let's see some other uh, piece in there and then we're going to go to see your painting we'll do that Elio we have quite a few pieces over here of uh, sculpture how you make these and what they represent these are very different from the ones we saw earlier because these are made from fiberboard and fiberboard is just a half inch sheet like a plywood so every one of these is composed of numerous pieces that have been cut and mitered and glued together to give the form. Something like this would probably have 40 to 50 pieces to construct that. Uh, and very, very often, like the sculptures, we'll start off as this did. This started off to be a piece that ended up close to what I, I have here. But when I developed it, as I cut pieces, every time I would take a mitered piece and add it, it would suggest another form, another direction. And when I had the, the, the idea in mind to do a figure, the, the motion of the figure had to be considered first. So then I started to cut in relation to where I wanted to go and not just be so uh, haphazard. Do I say right when this is the, the, a woman figure? Yes. There she is. That you can see in a different uh, position. Yes. I've done, uh, I, I, I've done a couple of dancers. Uh, the other dancer was far more elaborate, but uh, somebody decided to take her home, so I had to do another dancer because yeah. I always wanted another dancer. Yeah. Some of these other pieces, this is the uh, this is the reclining figure, which this is the last piece I did. And uh, it started out as an abstract uh, form. And from the form, I decided to take it to the figure oh. stage. You can see how many pieces are here. They're all, they're big enough to count. I was, I was building a fence and I was using four by four cedars many, many years ago. Oh, I would say, oh. 45 years ago. And the chunks of cedar that I cut off were all sitting in a pile. And I said, I think there's something there to do with those. So I started to miter them and join them. And when I joined them all together, this, these were all square, big blocks, but I did them in this form because I was doing the figure. And then I started to shape it, file it, and get it to this point. And what I wanted was an abstract sort of a shape but I wanted it to be figurative at the same time so when I when I did it I put it down the basement 
because I, I uh, had no place to show it at the time. And at the time it just started taking on the wear and tear of a basement. And when I looked at it, I thought, well, yeah, now it's, uh, it's got water stains, it's got, what am I going to do with it? Well, you know how many people come in and look at it and they want it with the water stains. And I thought, well, I better leave it alone because the water stains, somehow it says, I've been around, I've had a hard life. And when I did it initially, I had the head up, very proud. Yeah. And I looked at it and I thought, it doesn't say anything to me. So cut the head, bend it over, yeah. and now I got a man like the thinker. He's yeah. sitting there thinking. And I thought, that's the piece I want. So that's... Omerte. Yes. Yeah. yes. So that's the story. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's the oldest one I have. That's probably, like I say, 45 years old. Yeah. Yeah. When they tore the Salmoni building down next door, yeah. there were beams in the Salmoni building that had been there 150 years. The Salmoni building was 150 years old. When they took it down, I asked the demolition man if he could just give me a few pieces of wood to carve. Well, he filled my parking lot. I had so much wood, I had to start giving it away. But this, some of these pieces were so beautiful. So the wood is so old and it's so, it, it, it's, not now, it's not going to change anymore. So I worked with, uh, it's, it's a cedar, it's a white cedar from the West Coast, according to a man that knows wood better than I do. And as you can see, I left it because that was the beam, the original beam. There's still a nail hole where they put it together. And I, I did the relief on this side, and then as opposed to it being a completely round sculpture, I just kept the one side to show the history of the piece, which is from the old building. This, this is beautiful. And again, it's very stylized and very abstract. And what it really, what it really shows, there was another piece that I had done a, no, a number of years ago, which took the concept of perspective, where when you look at something, as it recedes, it becomes smaller. So I took that concept and applied it to the figure. So if this figure had been lying down, it shows perspective because the lower portion of the anatomy is closer. So I just took that concept and worked with it because I found it very intriguing and the other piece unfortunately has been uh, taken. So the, the whole idea about the piece was just to have a very good piece of wood yeah. that uh, had some, some meaning to me. It's beautiful. Well, we talked about Italy a little while ago. So here are some paintings uh, that I still possess from Italy. Uh, some of them have, have gone. Uh, these are some of the little towns that I visited. Uh, these are pieces that uh, I would do graphite sketches and then come home later and, and I would do the, the finished painting in oil or oil or watercolor. These are the watercolors that I did. I have some in oil. Uh, but these are so intriguing uh, little towns and villages that are uh, centuries old and uh, the structures have been around forever. They're still very solid. They're, they're so attractive because they have that, that kind of European romanticism about them. Uh, I don't know, uh, these, this, this one I called Posta because of the post office on the side. Uh, some of these I, I visited, uh, oh, probably eight or ten little villages within the valley and uh, never made notes, so I don't know which particular village it was, but they all have this sameness that I found very attractive. Yeah. Uh, and those are, those are the watercolors. Uh, some of the other pieces I have around, these are some uh, oils. Interestingly, there is a uh, conservation area in town that I just discovered a few years ago. I didn't know it was here. And I've gone out there and painted and just sat and did oil paintings because there was a little stream that ran through. And I have this great feeling for north. I love the north country. And this was like being up north. So I, yeah. I did a series of those. There are probably another uh, seven or eight that I did. 
Uh, this is a watercolor that I did, again, it's from Italy, but it's in a whole different style. And so I, I interpreted something that was interpreted in another medium. It's kind of uh, like a friend of mine calls it double filtering. Uh, but he's a winemaker, so he can only speak in those terms, I guess. Uh, these are, uh, I have here, the green piece is an engraving um, that uh, it took place over about four months. It's very, very intricate. Uh, it's done with a hand tool, a burin, and uh, I had far greater eyesight and patience back then to be able to do that. But when I completed it, I was quite happy with it, and I never understood what the problem with it was, but at one point I found I had to cut a path because I couldn't get into the bush. Strange way you think about pieces, yes. but... Uh, so that's one of the early engravings. Uh, the oil painting up here is from uh, when I went out to uh, Nova Scotia and uh, had a great trip, still pieces coming from that, that, uh, that trip. Uh, and the abandoned boats that sat around uh, or, were just so interesting to me because I could, I could just imagine the history of the boat and, and uh, how many families that little boat might have fed just by going out into the, into the, into the ocean and, and, yeah. uh, and fishing. Service, quality, marquee tile. Formaggi calati, prodotti genuini al 100%, mozzarella, ricotta, bocchettini e cedri. Prodotti calati si possono acquistare in qualsiasi negozio. Volete formaggi genuini per la vostra pizza, lasagna, cannoloni e cheesecake? Potete acquistare i prodotti direttamente al negozio al 931 The Camsi Road West. Fiero patrocinatore di Panorama Italiano. Roma Club di Limington, con accoglienti ed eleganti sale per ogni occasione. Eventi curati nei minimi dettagli da personale esperto. Cucina tipica tradizionale. At the Limington Roma Club, we want to remember our heritage by building our future. Al Roma Club di Limington, sarete contenti della vostra scelta. Nonna Pizza Pezzi, Rustici ed altro a Nonna Pizza al 486 Advanced Boulevard, Angolo Patillo e Isiro. La specialità della pizza è la cottura al forno a legna. Paolo per Ciballi offre modernissimi forni a legna a fuoco diretto e indiretto per la preparazione di deliziosi piatti e pizze per i vostri ospiti. Paolo per Ciballi, l'esperto di forni a legna all'11624 di Camusiro. Go ahead. That's another piece from Italy. It's a watercolor. It's, uh, it's the second rendering I did of that because uh, the first one uh, somebody took, I shouldn't say took, somebody bought, and uh, I just loved it. I, I had to have another one, so I, I did another one. Uh, another and one from Italy. Another one is that too, right? That's Italy up there. The arches are... Uh, uh, that piece I can't get away from. I've done it in watercolor. I've done that three or four times and I've done it in very interpretive ways and I've, this is a very straightforward watercolor but it was a beautiful scene. The architecture is just stunning in Italy. Uh, so another one again. From the archer are always appealing early on. Sorry? Arches are always appealing. Oh, and in this particular instance uh, when I did it for the third time uh, I looked at it and I, and, uh, I thought, uh, the one thing that struck me was I was in this, this little enclave by myself where uh, I had to go through the gate to photograph this. So I decided that at one point uh, it would be nice to put some figures in. So it's difficult to see but I have hidden in the corner two monks walking through the arches. Difficult to see again but on the left hand side in the left arch there are two monks. So I gave it a little more life. Yeah, that's good. 
And uh, over here, I suppose, oh. is one of those uh, <laughs> uh, good times that you have good with your friends, right? Good times, good times. This is, uh, this is a, it's a, a composite piece. Um, there are a number of musicians here that are friends of mine. Uh, of course, I had to populate it with more than just the musicians because we, we uh, on occasion would bring in some musicians and yeah. uh, and bring in a bunch of people and just enjoy the day. And that piece is uh, reminiscent of a lot of afternoons we've spent on the deck with musicians. So it, um, it brings me a smile every time I see it. I call it Sunday jazz, uh, but it could be anything. It could be jazz, could be blues, could be whatever. This is an example of the graphite sketch that I did in Italy. The 60 sketches I came back with. Uh, this one I knew where it was from. It was uh, in a little, little town called Bubio. And what was interesting to me, the door that's in the foreground, uh, it, was a, it was a vacant building, abandoned building, and you can see it's in some disrepair. But when we went into that door, we found uh, evidence that somebody was living there and we realized all of a sudden there was an artist living there and there were sketches on the floor that well, they weren't uh, necessarily keepers but obviously the artist had no time to repair the door oh it was, he they did, he wasn't even supposed to live there i'm sure yeah. he was a, he was a, yeah but there was also a door with a lock on it i see and i thought that's where the good work is <laughs> But we never got to see the good work. Yeah, but I respected yeah. the fact that this man, whoever it was, was living there, and uh, and good that they let him do that yeah. because obviously he had no other means. What now? What what we have here is uh, something most unusual because I have not heard of it being done, but uh, it's an actual aluminum embossing and that's done from an original plate. Uh, the plate was engraved and rather than ink it and print it, I embossed the aluminum into the plate. After which I inked it in the intaglio method, which is to give it its color. And at that point I laminated it and use it as just a print by itself. I have two here. Uh, I did a series. I was going to do the entire series of cards. I got to the Jack, Queen, King, and Joker, and I stopped. The King is gone. Uh, that Those two are the last of its kind. I won't do another one because they're just too laborious. And uh, when I put it on the press and, and emboss it, it has to stay there while I seal it and fill the back so that it, it, it has, it's a secure substance. Yeah. And that usually takes a day or two before I look at it and decide whether or not it's even any good. So it's very time consuming. Time consuming. Yeah. But I'm glad I did them and I'm very proud of them. But, uh, and they're unique, extremely unique. All these other mediums. Uh, yeah, no, you describe whatever it is you got. And uh, here we have, well, there's an oil painting again. That's from Italy. From a tw there's a 12th century castle that I, I was enamored with and did a lot of work with. Uh, I have some pieces from, uh, there's a, a vendor in Cuba that I was, uh, I was taken by, a uh, street vendor. Some of these pieces are imaginary pieces. Uh, we have a watercolor, or a, an, I'm sorry, an oil painting from uh, the, the riverfront in Italy. It's now the... Uh, parking lot of the casino, but back then it was the industrial heart of, of Windsor because that's where all the tracks came. Uh, and uh, people considered it perhaps an eyesore, but I considered it uh, just, aside from being an historical piece, as a young boy who liked to mess around in places where you shouldn't go, I just found it very intriguing. Uh, so I've done a number of pieces of that particular subject. Uh, there's another graphite at the top, and that is uh, that's a Monastero Bormida from Italy. Uh, I was, it was a, a scene I just loved to do. I did that over and over. But that's the sketch that was done right on the spot in uh, 1995. And it's, uh, it's an example of the 60 sketches I came back with. Uh, this one I just I loved, so I, I put that one up. Uh, an, another scene from Cuba. Some abstracts. Uh, my, 
one of my recent pieces was when we had the uh, eclipse not long ago. I was fortunate uh, because I couldn't look right up at it. I stood under the awning and I just uh, snapped it with my camera just as the clouds opened up because up prior to that we couldn't see anything. So I felt that was worthy of doing. Uh, and the piece, this is the piece I described earlier, the graphite where the artist had been living, the abandoned building. Yeah. And I used that sketch later to design and do this plate, which is a collagraph plate. So it's an original print. And uh, it's, an, it's a way I was using the sketches when I came back. The piece here, uh, which is a pretty violent seascape uh, with a, a lost dory in the distance was, again, it's a little bit of a throwback uh, when I was on the East Coast, I kept finding these abandoned dories up on, on land and uh, couldn't help but think that, uh, that uh, these little boats uh, probably did a lot more to develop the fisheries on the East Coast than anything else. Uh, and I just recently completed that one. Uh, yes. There are pieces, this, this is in the works, it's uh, not necessarily completed, but it shows uh, in process. It's, uh, I don't know what it is yet. <laughs> it will develop its own life and uh, at that point uh, we'll put a frame on it. But until then, uh, it's nice to have several pieces on the go at any one time. Uh, interestingly, I'm going to just pull this. This is on the, on the board right now and it's very unlike all of the other, let me put it over here where the light's better. It's very unlike all the other things I've done. But every now and then you just have to break away. And the reason that there's such a variety in the work is that, that it's necessary rather than to get into a production mode. Even if a piece is successful, uh, it's not necessary to do it again. But it's necessary to find another. Elio. Uh, what do you want me to say? I mean, uh, I've been uh, so great to have uh, this uh, interview with you and uh, to go over all of this uh, art that you got in there. That is incredible. I mean, I've been coming over here many times, yeah. but I never, we never, it was never time to, to do this kind of work. Whenever you come here, we have something else to do. We always yeah. have something going when and you come here. And go, 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 go. Yes. Yeah. But this time we had the, you know, the opportunity to stop and look at it. And this is beautiful. Now, Elio, I know that many people, they will, they will be curious and saying, first of all, how you can get in touch with you? Oh, I'm coming over here. Just come to Amherstburg or give me a call. I'm in the phone book. Uh, and uh, a lot of people come out here for ice cream and they come out here for the, we have many restaurants they have, and usually we're open. And if we're not, uh, I have a doorbell. So if it's the sign in there open, a wood sign, right? Yes. A wood sign in there say open, then they, they can come in, they right? Can come. And even when it's not there, they can come in. Ring the bell, if I answer, you come in. Right in front of uh, downtown Express Coffee. Yes. <laughs> That's where we're going now. The this is the Express. This is the heart of Amherstburg, right yeah. here, right here. Yeah. This is where everything happens there. Yeah. And as far as uh, students go, it's um, this is something that's that's it's got to be your passion. Uh, you don't do this to make a living. Uh, if you decide to do it, uh, good luck. And if I can help you, I will. Uh, but fine art because there are so many institutions now that that just like a mill they pass the students through pass the students through pass and it's it's good good for the students but it's it's uh, it's unfortunate uh, where do you go to make a living there are galleries that will sell your work but whose work it's no art. too many artists too few galleries too few people that understand what original art is. Uh, this is why the reproduction has become so big because you can actually make a reproduction for a few dollars and if you sell it for ten dollars you've made money but if you put a frame on it and sell it for a hundred dollars now you've made a lot of money. Well it's it, to me that's fraud 
but at the same time it's how you're going to manage to make a living so what it does it encourages them to go down the wrong path if this is your passion do it so at times we may see some uh, painting uh, was, uh, with the big huge frames in uh, some of the houses uh, and maybe the guy spend quite a bit of money to buy it but in effect the, vo the, the value of that is not there. I have had people take pieces on cons just on approval to see if it's going to work and they there was one very good example where they took it to a gallery and said we like this piece but we don't like the frame could you frame it for us sure the frame was worth they were charging far more for the frame than I charged for the, the art, for the original artwork yeah and art unfortunately is a business uh, and when it's a business it's going to happen people have to stay in business they have to make a profit uh, but unfortunately the one that's on the end is the artist and this is why I, I, I have uh, compassion for young people that uh, would have, have the, have the, uh, the calling they really want to be artists it's difficult Difficult. Elio, I thank you very much once again. Grazie infinite per avermi dato l'opportunità di far sapere ai nostri gentili telespettatori i tesori che tu sei qua, l'arte e l'ispirazione e la passione che hai specialmente nel mantenere la nostra cultura italiana, perché quello è molto molto importante per noi, mantenere la nostra cultura. Sì. E senza nessuno if and but io credo che tu sei uno dei primi a mantenere appunto questa arte diciamo qui nella zona di Windsor ti ringrazio per tutto quello che hai fatto e quello che farai nel futuro e ci rivedremo ancora sì. Sto, comunque sarò in attesa di questa tua mostra quando quandunque tu pensi di farla mettimi al corrente e sarò molto lieto di esserti di aiuto. Thank you. Grazie. Gra grazie a Leo. Gentili telespettatori, grazie per averci seguito nel nostro programma. Spero che sia stato interessante, avete visto quante opere d'arte eh, che diciamo, l'artista Elio del Col ha prodotto. Siamo molto fieri, gentili telespettatori, di questo artista che con la sua arte ha mantenuto la nostra cultura che ci è stata tramandata da parecchi artisti tramite i secoli e ha reso l'Italia la più famosa al mondo appunto per la cultura, scultura ed, ed altro. Uh, ne siamo veramente grati, caro Elio, del, del tuo lavoro, della tua passione, della tua arte e speriamo che i nostri gentili telespettatori possano venire a visitarti e diciamo e gioire nel vedere questi pezzi di arte che tu hai fatto nel passato ricordo l'indirizzo del di Elio e il suo telefono è sullo schermo quindi qualora siete interessati lo potete sempre chiamare vi ricordo poi gentili telespettatori che il 4 di novembre prossimo ci sarà Cemetery Sunday all'Evenrest Cemetery è una funzione annuale che si è fatta per parecchi anni ed è un'ora di raccoglimento per i nostri cari defunti. Quindi tutti possono partecipare a questa, questo evento, a questa Cemetery Sunday per le preghiere, sia che i nostri cari siano all'Emri Rest oppure in altri cimiteri, non fa differenza, è la preghiera per tutti i morti in occasione appunto della, della, della ricorrenza appunto di tutti quanti i defunti. Quindi potete benissimo partecipare a questi eventi, ci sono eh, sedie disponibili per tutti, quindi potete stare comodamente e ci sarà la partecipazione del, di Sua Eccellenza il Vescovo Dembrowski a questa cerimonia. Quindi invitiamo tutti a partecipare a Cemetery Sunday il 4 di novembre alle 3 di pomeriggio. 
Inoltre, gentili telespettatori da parte della Canadian Italian Businessmen Association, volevo informarvi che c'è un evento speciale con un menu estravagante per il 10 di novembre prossimo al Caboto Club. È un evento per raccogliere fondi per la Cancer Foundation e anche per borse di studio per la Canadian Italian Businessmen Association. Quindi partecipate a questo evento, vi divertirete, c'è un ottimo cibo, un, ottima, diciamo, un ottimo intrattenimento. L'evento inizia alle 6 di pomeriggio con l'antipasto e quindi ci sarà la cena alle 7 e mezza. Quindi tutti siete invitati a questo evento e per informazioni potete chiamare Gio Balsamo al 250 51 90 interno 416 oppure il Giovanni Caboto Club al 252 83 83. E infine ancora voglio ricordarvi che Max Borelli non era disponibile appunto per una intervista per quanto riguarda il vino e darvi un aggiornamento per la stagione vinicola del 2018 ma mi comunica che ancora c'è parecchia uva disponibile di tutte le qualità bianca e nera e quindi coloro che sono interessati ancora a fare un buon bicchiere di vino possono andare da Borelli, da Max Borelli ad Howard e diciamo vedere e scegliere l'uva di, di, di loro piacere. Eh, ci comunica anche Max che i prezzi sono più maleabili e la stagione vinicola durerà un altro paio di settimane, due o tre settimane. Quindi coloro che sono interessati possono recarsi da Max ad Howard e fare un buon bicchiere di vino. Arrivederci alla settimana prossima. Ciao! Per deliziosi pasti in famiglia, prodotti Primo. Fred Farm Fresh, la freschezza dei prodotti. Windsor Building Center ha tutto l'occorrente per i vostri lavori, laterizi e legnami di prima qualità come drywall, insulation ed altro, con servizio a domicilio in tempo e con la massima cura. La famiglia Riolo è lieta di servirvi sempre meglio in tutti i vostri acquisti. Windsor Building Center, Tecumseh e Benwell. Old Waterville Pharmacy, tradizionale farmacia italiana con due località, 870 Via Italia nell'edificio della Dolce Vita Retirement Levin e 1701 Wombat Street a Windsor. Servizio rapido e accogliente che il dottor farmacista Francesco Vella garantisce 7 giorni alla settimana. Si effettua servizio a domicilio e il personale parla italiano. Old Waterville Pharmacy, la farmacia italiana a Windsor.